Hello, lovely, and welcome back to another episode of The Way of the High Priestess. So if you've been following these episodes sequentially, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for following the journey, and thank you for receiving and being present. This is going to be a particularly fascinating episode for you because you've been hearing a lot about what's been happening in my relationship. And this may be an exciting episode for anyone who's listening because today I'm going to be talking all about sex. And there are so many things that contribute to meaningful, pleasurable, connected sex. And I'm going to dive into some of those things today. And thankfully, because I have experienced them. And for those of you who have been listening sequentially, you know that two episodes ago, I talked a lot about the challenges that Ani and I have experienced in our relationship. So it feels really nice to be coming to you with some really juicy, pleasurable content about all the ways in which we've created connection through the hardship and the ways in which some of that hardship has actually brought us closer together, emotionally, intellectually, sexually, spiritually. So that's what I wanna talk about today because sex can often seem like this mysterious thing from the great beyond that, you know, sometimes it's great if we're with a hot new partner and other times it's not, and we just don't know what makes the difference. And so while I'm not going to be talking about the mechanics of sex necessarily in this episode, as in positions and, uh, you know, different aspects of kink, I am going to be talking about the foundational components of sex, at least through my own experience. Now, I'll also say that this is not a full-on account of all things sexuality. This is my lived experience. And this is also what I have found is missing for so many people during sex. So I know this is not only my experience, this is the experience of many people, in particular, many women. So what makes for great sex, right? We, we see so many, we're like inundated with cosmopolitan magazines and BuzzFeed articles and Instagram posts about positions and, you know, different kink toys or toys, you know, whatever, right? All of these things are amazing. All of these things can make a huge difference. So I I don't wanna underwrite any of that or write any of those things off, I should say. Um, But there's something that is typically missing at the foundation for most people. And I have only discovered this by realizing that it was really missing in my sexual foundation And I discovered that in relationship with Ani and I've started to build this foundation. So let's just boil it down. And again, this is some of the statements I'm making are generalizations, but they are, they are generalizations for a reason, as in this is true for a lot of people. So take it with a grain of salt, take what you like, leave what you don't. So what makes for great sex? For women, it's emotional connection. And for men, it's the sex itself. If we could just boil it down to one thing for for each uh, gender identification, if you will, um, for women, it is emotional connection. Now, don't get me wrong. As a woman who has had a lot of sex, there are many things I love about many kinds of sex. I have loved novel sexual experiences. I've loved sex with new people. I've loved sex in new places. I've loved sex at the risk of someone catching us, you know, uh, forbidden sex. So all of these things can start to spark our sexual curiosities, our sexual desire, um, the part of us that wants to rebel or be ravished or, you know, whatever it is. But when we're talking about a long-term sexual connection with a partner, what is it that allows us to feel connected? What is it that allows the sex to feel satisfying? 
And so for women, emotional connection is so, so important. And when we talk about what makes up emotional connection, we have to talk about emotional safety. And this is this is a conversation that has been ongoing between Ani and I for as long as we've been together. And this is something he's actually taught me a lot about because as a woman who identifies and who has identified in the past as very independent, autonomous, can do it all on my own, safety wasn't a thought that I, I thought about often. Unless I was walking down a dark alleyway at night, then I thought about my safety. But on a regular basis, I never thought, I don't feel safe, or I don't feel emotionally safe here, or I don't, you know, my safety consciously was assumed. And what I was missing was that there were much deeper aspects of me that wanted to be seen and acknowledged by myself, firstly, and by my partner, if I was in partnership at the time. And so that emotional safety and it, there, there's so many complexities here. There's so many nuances, but I'd like to boil this down as simply as I can. That emotional safety within was, can I show up in any state, in any emotional state, in any mental state, in you know any way of being and still love and accept myself no matter what was coming up, no matter what I was thinking or how I was feeling, and do I have my own back? So that's the simplest way I can put how we can establish emotional safety within ourselves is, can I be both the overachieving perfectionist who's knocking it out of the park and also the one who's crying every five minutes on her couch and doesn't know why she's crying and feels like a hot mess? And can I be in either of those places and still love and accept myself equally? That is the definition I have found within myself around what it takes for me to feel emotionally safe within myself, with myself. So can I hold an infinite amount of emotional space for myself? Can I also hold myself accountable while being compassionate, right? Because it can't just be me saying like, oh, it's okay oh, you tried your best and not holding myself accountable for the places where I, I could be stepping up more or for the places where I do need to take responsibility for my actions. So it's this full spectrum. And when we as women can create emotional safety within ourselves, we feel more connected to ourselves. There's a deeper level of intimacy. It's like the friend that you go through life with and you have seen this friend go through everything You've seen them at their best. You've seen them at their worst. And you look at this friend and you're like, damn, girl, we've seen some things. Like we've been through some things together and I love you no less. In fact, I love you so much because of how dynamic you are and how dynamic our relationship has been. So when you think of somebody outside of you and you think of like all the places you've seen this person go and the fact that you know, if this is a very deep, unconditionally loving friendship that you love them no less or that they love you no less, no matter what has come up and they still call you on your shit and they still are compassionate and you feel supported, then that creates emotional safety and you feel deeply connected to that person. And as a result, you want to spend time with them. You want to share things about yourself with them. Now with a friend, you may not wanna be sexually intimate, but you feel a closeness and connection. Now with a partner, you can establish that same foundation and you can have seen some things and been through some things with them. And maybe you've had your own hardships in between the two of you. And you're like, damn, but we made it out on the other side. Look at how much stronger and better we are for it. Now, if there is actual sexual attraction because they're your partner and you have a romantic relationship, this can also breed emotional openness. It can also breed sexual openness and sexual desire. So this is a huge component for women. And I, I talk so much about this and I'm gonna be continuing to talk about this. And side note, um, very, very, very special sneak peek and secret only for those of you who are listening. 
is that Ani and I are going to be talking a lot more about this over the next couple of months because he is going to be a recurring guest on the show. We're going to be doing episodes together and I'm so excited about it. So we're going to be diving deep into this. So if this is something that you want to hear more about, then stay tuned because over the next couple of months, we are going to be going so deep, insert sexual joke here. (laughs) We're going to be going so deep into these concepts because this is what we have learned in our relationship. This is what we have been studying as we do our own work and work with other couples and individuals around intimacy and sexuality. Um, And this is what I have noticed in my own life. And I feel like I'm, I'm a, a, a pretty solid prototype for high achieving women who want to be in intimate and close connection and have just had some of my own roadblocks. And as you know, I'm, I'm typically not shy about sharing those things here. So something that I had found in relationship with Ani, especially when we were going through some of our hardest moments was that the first thing to go was sexual, sexual connection. And for me, and for most women, that is because when we are stressed, the first thing to go is our sex drive. Our libido plummets. We are concerned about so many other things, especially because we have this multifaceted diffuse awareness where we can literally have our mind on like 50 things at once. We are thinking about the bills, we're thinking about work, we're thinking about maybe the kids or cooking or family. And so it is, it can be very easy for us to become overwhelmed, to really feel the stress of all of these things at once because our attention can be in so many places at once. Whereas with men, they're pretty single-minded. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, neuroscientifically, they focus on one thing at a time which is sometimes why they don't multitask or they forget to do things that you've asked them to do by no fault of their own. This is just how their brain works. So when we feel stressed out as women, the first thing to go typically is our sex drive. Unless we have a very strong foundation with our own sexuality or strong foundation in relationship with our partner around sexuality and emotional connection, then sex goes out the window. Now, when we feel stressed out, typically we don't feel emotionally safe. We are in this place and that, trying to manage everything, not feeling emotionally grounded, not feeling like we can relax, and sex is off the table. Now, when we take sex off the table as women, obviously, you know, the men don't have a choice. And obviously, I'm only, I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm referring to heterosexual relationships, but This can also be the case in any other configuration. When one person takes sex off the table, sex is usually off the table for the other person. So um, when that happens, and like I said earlier, it's the sex itself that allows men to be connected. And of course, how present his partner is during sex and, and how much pleasure his partner is receiving is also a huge part of connection for men. But when we take sex off the table, sex gets taken off the table for them and they lose their bid at connection or one of their avenues to connection. So now we're not feeling emotionally connected with ourselves, which is the the starting place of connection. It can be so easy for us to say, oh, you know, I don't feel connected to my partner. He's not doing this or I'm not feeling emotionally supported. And these things may be true. However, the question I always ask myself and I prompt my clients to ask themselves is, how connected do you feel to yourself? Is that connection established and strong within yourself? Because if it is, typically the ability to be able to ask for your needs from your partner in a compassionate and loving way is accessible. So if I feel emotionally connected to myself and I'm not feeling emotionally connected to Ani, it is much easier for me to say, hey, babe, what's is, you know, what's happening? I'm not feeling an emotional connection. Is something happening for you? I'd love to connect, like 
what, what way would it feel good for you? I'd love to find a way to get back into emotional connection. However, if I'm not feeling emotionally connected to myself, then my ability to articulate that comes out in many different ways. And it's not very articulate. It might be me throwing a temper tantrum or me projecting anger at something completely unrelated, like dishes in the sink. But really it's coming from this place of disconnection with myself. So establishing emotional connection with ourselves is one of the most important things for our sexual health. Now, thematically speaking, they may seem unrelated, but they are so closely related that they're, you know, it's like two clasping hands together. So if you have been experiencing a dip in your sexuality, be it in your sexuality with yourself, with your partner, um, with anybody else, go back and see what's happening in your emotional connection with yourself. How emotionally connected to yourself are you feeling? How supported by yourself are you feeling? How turned on by yourself are you feeling? How tuned in to your body's needs, to your emotional needs, to your physiological needs are you feeling? Are you rushing through the day just to cross things off and feeling stressed? Or are you taking a moment to step outside and look at the sun and feel it on your face or to luxuriate in a bath. So look at your emotional landscape inside to see if there are any things that you intuit would need to be shift so that you can feel a little more open and relaxed to have your sexual energy flow through you. So it's not that, you know, you ever not become a sexual being as, I mean, yes, that may happen from a hormonal and chemical level, numbers may drop, but there, as long as you're alive, there's always sexual energy flowing through you. That is what animates us. That is our life force energy, our chi, our prana, our kundalini, sexual creative energy. As long as we are alive and moving, that energy is always flowing through us. Now, the fact that we may experience blockages in its flow is the thing to look at. It's not that we are just not sexual beings anymore unless we actually identify as asexual, which is not the majority of people. So in order for our sexual energy to flow, there just has to be an open channel. So it's not that we have to do a bunch of things, like we have to learn this position and that technique. All those things can be helpful. But if we just clear the debris, if we just allow ourselves to be open, which typically comes in a stress-free, relaxed, surrendered state, then the sexual energy has more of a chance to be able to flow through us. Think of it like having there being a traffic jam on a highway, right? When there is a 10 car pile up, there is blockage. Cars can't get through. So there is a backup. There's traffic. There's heavy traffic. You're bumper to bumper. When the pile up gets cleared up, that is akin to there being an opening, an open channel on the highway and an open channel within you. So as the, as the policemen and firefighters are doing their job to clear the channel, so too can you do your job to clear the channel. And that is not necessarily an active doing. Sometimes that may, might be a non-doing. That might be you stepping out of the way and not doing the very next thing you had on your list. Maybe you do it in 10 minutes from now so that you can take a 10 minute breather. Maybe you go for a walk. Maybe you decide not to go out tonight and you stay home and you don't hang out with people. You just have time and space to yourself. That's gonna look different for you in any given moment. But whatever that is, just allowing the channel to open. And you're going to know what that is for you as you tune into your body, your needs, your emotions. And when the channel is open, it's not, again, that we have to go and, you know, tune into something sexual, though that can be very helpful to see something sexual, to see something that arouses us or turns us on. But typically when we are in a relaxed state, that energy can just start to, to flow through. And it may be subtle. It may not be overtly arousing. It might just be 
subtle sensation in the body that says, oh, wow, I can feel, I can feel. Okay, I'm aware of sensations in my body. So that's this foundation for sexual connection. And I wanna say that I struggled a lot with this. I thought that there was something wrong with me forever and ever. Like I needed to see this practitioner and work with this sex coach and do this emotional clearing because there was just something wrong with me. And that's why I wasn't performing sexually. That's why I wasn't feeling sexual, et cetera. So if that sounds like you, there's nothing wrong with you. And of course, if you're experiencing actual physiological symptoms of something, then of course, seek support from an appropriate practitioner. But generally speaking, it is our undue amounts of stress that we experience and internal pressure that we put on ourselves that's usually not necessary and usually never helps. That is the block to our sexual energy. So even if for a short amount of time, like two weeks or a month, you could just try giving yourself more space to really see what could just open inside of you, just naturally open very gently. This is very a very feminine approach. We're not doing and solving and fixing, right? That's a very sort of masculine directive penetrating approach. We are just allowing, we're surrendering. We are letting go and we're being gentle and nurturing with ourselves. This is what allows an easeful, pleasurable flow where we're not burning ourselves out even more to try and fix a problem that we may not have. So that's sort of my, <laughs> my PSA. Um, and I wanna talk about myths about sex as well because these are some mm -hmm some sort of mental dilemmas that can get in the way of our sexual energy flowing. Now, these are all mental dilemmas that I have had myself and there are many more. So if you're listening to this and if you and you have had a different mental dilemma, write to me, let me know what yours was because you know, I'd love to be able to add these kinds of things to the the teaching and um, I'd love to be able to just have a more diverse perspective about what other people are experiencing. So here are some myths that have kept me from being deeply connected to my own sexual energy. Um, one, in order to have sex, I have to feel sexy. I have to be in the mood and feel sexual. Now, these two are big ones because this assumes that I have to be a certain way before I can allow myself to receive and feel pleasure because what is sex if not feeling pleasure right now i i understand as well that sex for many people is about performance is about pleasing someone else is about um a release and that's all okay i have used sex for all of those things as well and there i want to invite another perspective in that sex can be about relaxing. Sex can be about connecting. Sex can be about finding ourselves and, you know, finding ourselves both with a partner, but as well as solo, it can be about finding ourselves and getting to know a partner better, right? There's so many other things. And I want to invite us to expand our perspective on what sex can be, because I operated for most of my life with this tiny little like blinder on I'm like, you know, like I was looking through a telescope and I just had this tunnel vision about sex because for so much of my life, sex was very performative. I used sex to gain love and validation from men because I, I wasn't able at the time to, to deeply provide that for myself in the ways that I had sought it out from others. And that was, you know, part of my daddy issues. So I, I sought these kinds of relationships to feel sexy. And I thought that if I want to feel sexy, I need to show up as sexy. I need to show up a certain way to be desired, to give him what he needs so that I can get what I need. So all the while I was being performative and being concerned about his pleasure. And if I look sexy for his pleasure, for his gaze, 
but really it was also a very selfish act because it was feeding me also. So just a little tangent, this, for some of you, this may be um, a relatable dynamic. So one, I have to feel sexy and I have to be in the mood or feel sexual in order to have sex or to have sexual connection. And while that can feel true sometimes, it doesn't have to be true. Case in point, Ani and I had amazing sex yesterday, like just heart expanding, soul widening, beautiful, pleasurable, emotional connecting sex. And coming into the sexual experience, neither of us felt sexy. We felt like kind of out of it, a little tired. This was the middle of the day. And I was like, I don't feel desirable right now. I don't feel sexy. And he was like, I know that you may not feel desirable to yourself. And I know that your desirability with yourself is going to be something that ebbs and flows depending on where you're at in your cycle, maybe what clothes you're wearing, if you have makeup on, you know, how you feel in your body, but just know that your level of desirability to me never changes. I always desire you. And hearing that, it, what it first did wasn't turn me on sexually. It opened my heart. This is going back to that emotional connection. It opened my heart because I was like, oh my God, babe. Oh my God. Ah, thank you. Oh, thank you. That means the world to me. Oh, and it just softened me. It, it invited me into surrender. He wasn't forcing me to do anything. He wasn't forcing me to, you know, he didn't say like, oh, you shouldn't think that. That's silly. You're, I always want you. You're desirable. He validated my perspective. And again, this is a, a pro tip, just the tip, <laughs> a pro tip about how to create emotional opening. He validated my perspective and it allowed me to feel seen and heard in what I was feeling. He didn't try and change me. And then he shared his perspective and it was different than mine. And it just opened my heart and that opened my body. That started to open my body to say like, okay, wow, he desires me. And maybe I don't feel all hot right now, but maybe there's some, some other mood that we can strike here because I also want to invite all of us to see sex as yes, it can be hot and passionate and 50 shades of gray esque, but sex can also be so many other things. It can be slow and steady. It can be deeply emotional and vulnerable. It can be two people stopping their work day, feeling tired and wanting to connect and, you know, figuring it out together. It can be mysterious. It can be awkward. It can be so many things. And if we can just invite these many different perspectives in, then it allows us to have a very dynamic experience without expectation, because we all know expectation, when it's fulfilled, it's great, but when it's not, it sucks. And who wants sucky sex unless we're getting sucked off, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just gonna come with these, with these jokes the whole way through. Okay, so, you know, that's one thing, right? Sex can be so many different ways. Now, another myth that I have totally played into and that I know a lot of other people, especially women play into is I have to desire it. In order for me to have sex, I have to desire it. Now, here's what I'll say. In my own experience, in studying the work of Esther Perel, Alison Armstrong, and many other amazing leaders in the space of sex and intimacy, letting sex wait for desire, especially when you are in an established relationship and you're not just courting each other, if you let sex wait for desire, it's not gonna happen. And not that it's never gonna happen, but especially for women, because we have so many things that fluctuate inside of us, 
our hormones, our cycles, our emotions, our priorities, our focus throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, waiting for desire, especially when we've been with a partner for, you know, a number of years, it just is not going to happen as often as it probably needs to happen for there to be sexual connection and for even sexual maintenance to occur. And so this is something Esther Perel talks about. Um, she talks about some sex being maintenance sex. And of course, this is all amongst consenting adults. This is not, there's no force applied here, but this is when two or more adults come to the table and they recognize that sometimes sex isn't going to be fireworks. Sometimes there's going to be an amount of maintenance sex that happens to keep everything polished, right? To keep, it's like getting a tune-up on the car, right? It's not always that we're doing major work to the car and getting the body refinished. Sometimes we're getting maintenance done and that helps the car to operate. We, op we work in the same way. So thinking that there always has to be these firework levels of desire and always you're feeling swept off your feet and always there is this like romantic getaway. Like if you have that, fucking kudos to you. That's rad. Hit me up because I want to hear all about it and I want to have you on the show because I want to talk about it. If that's not the case for you, like it isn't for many people and like it wasn't for a period of time in my relationship with Ani, we both had to recognize that sex serves a hugely important purpose in relationships that are romantic, at least if that's the configuration that you're having sex with your partner and that it helps create connection. Now I could have any number of excuses as to why I didn't desire it from stress to being tired, et cetera, et cetera. And I recognize that it was my personal responsibility to create emotional openness within myself so that I could be open to something that actually feels good for me. Like, why would I deprive myself of something that could feel good? Now, what I will say is during the times when I did not desire sex, typically there was some sort of emotional disconnection, firstly within myself, but also within my relationship with Ani. So for me, that needed to be addressed first before I could be really open to sex. Now for him, having a sexual experience created more emotional closeness. So you have to um, be really intentional in recognizing that there can be a stalemate sometimes because I needed emotional connection before sex and sex for him created emotional connection. So we had to find a way to create a middle ground so that we could say, okay, what do you need from me so that I could get my needs met and vice versa. And, you know, what do I need? And, and, and having a conversation about that. Um, okay, so here's another myth. And this is just, you know, perhaps from a woman's perspective is that, you know, on both sides, one that I either need to be performing all the time and I need to be sexy and desirable in a certain size or looking a certain way, I will tell you, most of the time, men do not care. They do, okay, yes. Does sexy lingerie and effort and intention turn them on? Absolutely. And a lot of times they just wanna connect with you. And sex is an amazing way for them to connect with you. And more often than not, for the men who are intentionally approaching sex, whether they are aware of it or not, for them to be inside of you, is such a gift. There is such deep connection for them in that. And there can be such deep connection for us in that too, to feel someone inside of us. Like, wow, that is literally the closest someone could be is inside of us. They're not even like, you know, pressed up against our faces. They're literally inside of us. There is energy that men receive from being inside of a woman. It can be nourishing for them and if we are doing our own inner work and inner exploration to be open to receiving, it can be very nourishing for us as well. So the, the thoughts of us needing to be a certain way and us needing to perform a certain way 
or him needing to be a certain way and him needing to perform a certain way. Like he needs to be rock hard the whole time or what's wrong with him. Or if he's not rock hard, what's wrong with me? Why is he not turned on by me? Start to notice what thoughts are percolating and marinating in your mind that are keeping you from being present. You know, this is for men and women. Notice what thoughts are keeping you from being present, whether it's a thought about them, a thought about yourself, because most of these are assumptions. Most of them aren't true. And if you actually opened up a conversation with your partner about these thoughts, you'd probably find that there's no basis in reality for them or that you can have a conversation that if that conversation is had with intention and with radical responsibility and with compassion, as in there's not finger pointing or blaming the other or oneself, then there, it, that kind of conversation about the kinds of things that keep us from being present during sex or that keep us in judgment during sex can actually open to intimacy. It can create intimacy and connection. That can create emotional safety, emotional connection, and that could lead the way to you wanting to have sex. Because when you are open, you're open. You want to receive emotionally, physically, sexually. So that's another myth. Um, and then the last one I want to cover here is that sex has to look, feel, or be a certain way, right? So this is what I was talking about earlier. Sex has to be passionate. I have to feel swept off my feet. It has to, you know, happen in a certain amount of time. We have to show up this way before X. This is the invitation from before is can you allow sex to be whatever way it is and acknowledge how you're showing up and let that be okay. Acknowledge how your partner's showing up and let that be okay. And also make invitations. So if the sex starts off feeling disengaged, okay, accept where you're at in the moment, but can there be an invitation into more engagement and into more presence versus a demand? Because I can tell you that when I would demand things from Ani or when I would become critical about how he was showing up or about how I was showing up, it did not lead to more sexiness. It was the antithesis of sexiness. It led to disconnection and falling flat and feeling turned off. So see where things are and see where you'd like them to be. And how can you be and create the invitation into something other than what you're currently experiencing. So an example from my life is there were times when I, I didn't feel Ani's presence, but that was because I wasn't present. He couldn't feel me. So it was a turnoff for him. And when these were, when these things were going undiscussed, it, there was a chasm between us there was a gap between us. And so when I start to say, okay, I see that, you know, I'm not feeling he's being present. Am I present right now? And if I'm not present, how can I become more present? And then how can I invite him into greater presence by being present and by maybe making eye contact with him or gently stroking his face or holding him close to me or asking him to hold me or making a request for my needs, or asking him what he needs, right? These are all ways that I can invite in and I can be the invitation, an open-hearted invitation into what I desire versus saying like, why aren't you hard? You should be hard. Or what's wrong with me? He's not hard. You know, all of these other mind tricks that, that we play with ourselves. So the invitation here is can we expand how we see ourselves, and by extension, how we see sex, how we show up to sex. And this is, again, coming back to that emotional safety. Can we be that space for ourselves where we accept all that's coming up for us, how we're showing up, and can we hold space for that? And then can we be the invitation for ourselves and, by extension, our partner to step into what we want to step into if we're not already there? That might be more connection, more presence, more gentleness. So can we expand how we see ourselves and not put us in a box of, I always have to be desirable and sexy and turned on or else X, Y, Z. 
And then can that expand how we see ourselves sexually and the kinds of sex that we have? And so this last part here that I want to close with, that I want to uh, have a happy ending with, if you will, is what sex can be, right? Because sex can be so many things. And I know that for so many of us, sex has been things other than pleasurable. It has been things other than consensual. It has been painful. And I want to really acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge that sex has had many different shapes and forms and flavors for many of us. And I hold that with so much honor and regard. And this episode is really about reconciling these, these places within ourselves so that even if we have experienced trauma or things that have left uh, a mark on us, uh, a negative impact within ourselves, and it doesn't even have to be with a partner yet, or it can be, but can we start to uh, create safety within ourselves so that sex and our sexuality can feel like a source of regeneration? Sex can be regenerative, regenerative, it can be replenishing. And whatever path you may need to walk for that to be so, then absolutely seek the support that you need or you know, do the inner processing that you need for this to even occur as a possibility. And if it's not a possibility right now, that's absolutely okay. Like where you are is perfect. There is nothing wrong with you. You are perfect where you are. And I'm, I'm stating this so that there can be other possibilities that occur for you, even mentally, if that's all it is right now. And for those of you who are like, fuck, yeah, I want to know more about that. Or yeah, I'm already there. Awesome. That's great too. So sex can be regenerative, both solo and partnered. It can be a source of energy, a source of connection, a source of intimacy and exploration, a source of emotional vulnerability. And these are, you know, I talked about some of the ways to make it so in this episode. Sex can be a great way to connect with ourselves, with our needs, with our desires, with our fantasies, with our fears. And it can be a great way to connect with others. Sex can be a creative portal. It can be a place that because we're open, we receive ideas. And Ani and I often use sex in this way. We will... We have our own little ritual where we talk and we stretch before sex and we we just have so many ideas come through and we have ideas come through before sex and during sex. And it's like, I, I joke and I often say like, we need to record this. And yes, it would be hot if we video recorded it, but we need to audio record all the conversation we're having before, during and after sex, because there are so many amazing ideas that come through that it's like, it becomes this creative idea portal. Sex can also be a way to get embodied, to be present with our sensations, to be present with our emotions, to get into our bodies and tune into what feels good, what doesn't feel good, what we want more of or less of or more pressure with. This is a way to like really become present and in our bodies right here, right now. Sex can also be a meditation. Again, another way to tune into the present moment, to tune into ourselves, to tune into our partners and to be here now. So these are simply invitations to, to me, to you, to all of us about what sex can be. Sex is at the very core of our humanity. It is how we came to be. It is why we are here. It is one of our most basic biological needs and drives. Like we have a drive for procreation biologically. And so it, it is nothing to be ashamed of. And if you carry shame, like I had carried for most of my life, and you know, there may still be some there around different aspects, I see you and I acknowledge you and know that sex is the most natural part of your existence, of our existence. And as we go on the inner journey to exploring our sexuality, there are so many gifts and treasures along the way. And I invite the conversation. So if this 
episode really resonated for you, please reach out to me. Send me a DM on Instagram at leenoto underscore. Shoot me an email, hello at leenoto.com. Reach out and let me know what resonated. I love hearing feedback from you. And if you're someone who's already done this, then you've probably gotten a voice note from me thanking you for reaching out. I've probably asked you what resonated most, where you're feeling challenged, how I can support. This is such an important conversation to have because this is at the core of who we are as women, as men, you know, however we identify, this is at the core of our life. This is, so this is at the core of who we show up as at work, our, how we show up to our finances, how we show up to our health, because this is the nucleus of who we are as humans. So this is one of the most important things we could ever address and explore in my humble opinion, but I also know this to be true. So reach out if you have questions, comments, curiosities. I love having these conversations. If you're open to being live coached on the show and this is an area you wanna be coached in, also reach out. I would absolutely love to have you on the show. We'll do a live coaching session, which is so valuable um, if you're feeling courageous to sort of, you know, be vulnerable and express and be supported. This is a huge value um, in terms of how you can get supported. And if there is something that resonated, I also invite you to share this. Please, please, please share this with others who could really use this, who this would really support. And um, I also invite you to share this out. Take a screenshot of this episode Um, do a screen recording of the part of the episode that really resonated most for you and share it on your stories, share it on your Instagram, send it to friends who really need this. This helps, you know, those things help this content get out to others. And that is so important right now. So thank you for spreading the love. Thank you for tuning in and being present. Thank you for being open and willing to receive. I am so grateful for you. And I'm sending you so much love and so many sexy vibes. And I look forward to coming back on soon and coming back with Ani. And remember, um, if you're following this episode and if you've been following the show, uh, I'm going to be doing a number of episodes coming up with Ani. So we're going to be diving into this. So if you have any questions, please DM me or email me so that we can address those head on on the show. We'd love to answer them and get your needs met. All right, sending you so much love.